Hello, my name is Frank Kwan, and welcome to Schools on Point. This half hour, we'll be talking about some of the major issues impacting schools and public education here in Southern California and across the state. With me is Dr. Deborah Duardo, the Los Angeles County Superintendent of Schools. The Los Angeles County Office of Education serves 80 public school districts and 13 community colleges that educate more than 2.5 million students. Joining us is California State Senator Stephen Bradford. He's a Democrat representing California's 35th Senate District. Senator Bradford is chair of the Labor and Industrial Relations Committee and a member of the Committees on Appropriations, Energy, Utilities and Communications, Governmental Organization, Public Safety, the Select Committee on Women and Inequality, and the Select Committee on Women, Work and Families. Welcome, and with that, let's begin. Good morning, Senator Bradford, and thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with you to better serve our students and our families in Los Angeles County. We've worked together on some legislation policies that benefit the schools in the community, and your, your support for that has been essential. But before we get to some of those items, please tell us what inspired you to become a public servant. Insanity. Um, <laughs> um, well, I, I started out with every intention of being a doctor when I went to college. Mm. And um, somewhere along the lines, I realized uh, that wasn't going to happen. And I met an individual by the name of Mervyn Dimley, who was a former congressman, former lieutenant governor, assemblyman. And he took me under his uh, wings and kind of like served as a mentor to me. And I realized it was a lot I could do giving back to my community mm -hmm. and this is about service so mm -hmm. um, and it was steeled in my mother and father and in, in being involved so it's just an extension of that. You know you talked a little bit about insanity but <laughs> and I think maybe I can refer back to the Great Recession and now we're in a period of uh, better times, mm -hmm. economic recovery. Mm -hmm. So you've been in the legislature during those times. How have those experiences kind of influenced your view and, and the decisions that you make now? Uh, tremendously. Uh, many times you, you run for office with goals and objectives of what do you say you'll never do or what you, what you plan on doing. And uh, seven years ago, we found ourselves cutting programs that we would have never thought we would have cut as Democrats, Republicans, just as Californians, such as education, uh, senior services. I mean, we even cut funding for hearing aids for seniors, and mm. we would have never thought we would have to do that. Mm. But at the time uh, where our financial crisis was at all time worse since the Great Recession, uh, those are some of the cuts we've made. Now, looking back seven years later, we're in a better financial position, so we're restoring a lot of those uh, funding uh, programs I uh, should I say funding for the programs that were critically important to California. So it's a big difference and I'm excited about where we are today and where we have the opportunity to go and go moving forward. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, we're really lucky to have you there representing us. I'm just interested if you can tell us a little bit about the difference between serving as a member of the state assembly and as a senator in the Capitol. Uh, I think it's a little bit more give and take. Mm -hmm. In the assembly, you have 79 colleagues, and when you move over to the Senate, it's only 40 of us, and we all think we're the smartest people in the building. But uh, uh, I, I just think it's it's pretty much the same job. It's just mm -hmm. less give and take, and uh, uh, you really have to count your votes in, uh, on the Senate side because you can't lose. You have less to work with over mm -hmm. there. So, uh, In the Senate, you chair the Standing Committee on Labor and Industrial Relations, and that among other bills, the committee considers issues relating to labor, unemployment, and public school employees. Mm -hmm. Now, we've heard for a while about the teacher shortage, and I think we're still going to be facing that over the next several years. But you also talk about the workforce, other parts of the workforce that are also facing shortages. So what are some of the challenges that you see facing our workforce and employers at the same time? Because they go together. Without a doubt. I mean, one is finding quality employees. Mm -hmm. That's many times what we hear from employers that we just can't fill these positions and at the same time uh, pr providing those opportunities. Uh, workers comp is one of those issues that have been, uh, has impacted and will continue to impact work relations throughout the state of California. So that's uh, issue that is at uh, the forefront all the time when we mm -hmm. talk about uh, Labor and Industrial Relations Committee and how do we make that work. But more importantly, having a qualified workforce, uh, workforce readiness, uh, we hear that all the time. So trying to 
put forth programs and, 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 and educational opportunities. Mm -hmm. So we have people ready to go to work, we're, we're ready to fill these positions as they come available. So it's a collaboration of both the employer and the workers and sometimes we find ourselves doing this and mm -hmm. I say labor and business need to find a way to work together and find those compromises. So uh, that's what we're trying to do with this committee. Hmm. And that's interesting because you talked about education and how critical it is that education is a part of this conversation uh -huh. and is looking ahead in terms of how we're preparing our students for the future uh -huh. and for the workforce. And you've been a longtime supporter of career, um, career technical education or CTE uh -huh. programs. Uh, Governor Brown and the legislator approved more funding for CTE, which we're very excited about. Um, which is scheduled to come to an end soon uh, unless it's extended. Can you tell us a little bit more about your thoughts on how we can ensure that we, we have the funding that we need to make sure that our students are prepared and aligned to future um, career opportunities that, that, that some of jobs that we don't even know what they'll be in the future. Exactly. Uh -huh. uh, one, to stay vigilant and let our voices be heard and let not only legislators like myself, but the governor know that this is important. Career tech education used to be a priority and somehow it's taken a back seat over the last 30 or 40 mm -hmm. years where we've devalued working with our hands. We've built this country working with our hands mm -hmm. and for some reason we weren't promoting uh, those type of uh, job opportunity and training opportunities in our school system. I remember going up and uh, growing up and going to public schools and graduating from Gardena High School. You had machine shop, mm -hmm. you had automobile shop, you had plumbing, electrical and mm -hmm. we and a lot of schools no longer offer that and I think we do young folks a great disservice when we say you're going to go to a four-year college mm -hmm. when the truth is we don't have enough seats if every child wanted to go mm -hmm. to college in California. We don't have enough seats to accommodate them. Mm -hmm. So career tech is an opportunity where young mm -hmm. folks can find out early, hey, I like working with my hands. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like coding. I like mm -hmm. uh, computer technology or whatever the case may be. And it mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily require me to have a four-year degree, but it will mm -hmm. require me to have additional education through the career tech environment. So I hope we put a whole lot more emphasis and a whole lot f more funding in that area. And that's why we want to prepare our students for both career and college mm -hmm. and then you know making sure that they're prepared to go to college if they mm -hmm. choose that path but if not that they can also go on and choose whatever type of um, you know tech program or whatever else they're interested in. That's, we have to provide great. those options mm -hmm. exactly. And I think it is about the range of options, mm -hmm. but at times it always seems to come back to funding. Mm -hmm. um, new in California, relatively new, is Local Control Funding Formula, LCFF. And it was meant and designed to, I think, provide more funding to schools that serve low-income English learners and foster youth. Um, and again, going back to CTE, Career Technical Education, what are some of those options that we've talked about, though, in the financial area considered by the legislature so that we can extend the CT incentive grant program to try to do more encouragement here? Well, I, I, I don't have specific options. I mean, we're always just looking to move dollars in that direction and uh, looking at our budget every year, especially in the educational uh, funding area and, and, uh, and education. So I know it's a priority with a lot of my colleagues to make sure that we make this a priority. Uh, we have uh, the Chirac uh, South Bay Regional Occupational Center in my district that we've worked over the last three or four years to make sure that we provide funding there because it was a threat at one point that that facility would close and it has provided a wealth of opportunities for people in that region whether they are displaced workers that needed to be retrained so we're looking at that as a legislative body uh, just to make sure that we bolster that up whether it's in the community college whether it's again in K through 12 to make sure that we fund that and again expose these young folks to these opportunities that exist there. It's pretty much the range of education opportunities. It's not just K-12, mm -hmm. not just community colleges, but mm -hmm. the entire range. Mm -hmm. Would I do that? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Senator, you previous, previously chaired the Assembly Selection Committee on the status of boys and of men in color, mm -hmm. and, and that's critical to us here in L.A. County. Um, for me, especially when I look at the disparities and some of the outcomes for our students, mm -hmm. um, especially when I look at the students who were serving that are incarcerated and how many of those 
young men and women are children of color. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit more about the history of that committee and some of the goals and what you're hoping? Um, you know, it's, it seems like we're constantly looking and, and looking and making sure that we're doing right by all of our children. Can you tell us a little bit more? I, yeah, I was honored to cheer uh, mm -hmm. the select committee on boys and men of color, uh, mm -hmm. but to contrast, I'm sorry, we need a committee such mm -hmm. as that, uh, mm -hmm. but it speaks volumes to where our young men of color fall through the gaps, mm -hmm. whether it be in the education system, mm -hmm. whether it uh, uh, school the prison pipeline, mm -hmm. you name it. Uh, We've heard testimony throughout the state of California, mm -hmm. what all the challenges are from willful defiance to just expulsion rates at an all-time mm -hmm. high. And I, I wish we had the committee in the Senate side, uh, mm -hmm. the Select Committee of Boys and Men of Color is only on the Assembly side. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm looking to hopefully form a similar uh, uh, Select Committee on the Senate to deal with these issues. I mean, mm -hmm. we're also looking at a select committee on women and mm -hmm. uh, uh, girls and women as, as well. Mm -hmm. But we've seen through the testimony that there is a crisis when it comes to educating our young boys and men of color for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we don't understand why they're, they're looked at as you know, a, a greater challenge than uh, the rest of the population, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a, fa a factor that we ne definitely need to focus on, and uh, we've been working on in the legislature. Again, we passed legislation um, uh, regarding willful defiance in mm -hmm. schools, restorative mm -hmm. justice, and those are the issues that we need to continue to work on, mm -hmm. uh, not only through the legislative process, but Mm -hmm. through society as a mm -hmm. whole. Well, thank you for doing that work. And I know for some of the work that I did and even my dissertation on attendance, it was really alarming to see the differences, uh, even in attendance, uh, looking as early as kindergarten mm -hmm. and preschool and seeing the differences mm -hmm. um, with certain populations, mm -hmm. and, and mostly Latino and African American, which is a concern if our earliest learners starting in preschool and kindergarten are not engaged then something's going on with how we as a society and as a system are providing education to children that don't feel uh, as engaged. So say, thank you for, for thank sharing you. that. What we've heard, if you don't mind me adding, is uh -huh. that some of the young folks say, I don't see anybody that looks like me mm -hmm. in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And that's important. I mm -hmm. mean, sometimes we don't factor that in, but when you mm -hmm. don't see a male role model, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it can affect your interest mm -hmm. in whatever it is. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I think there's there's a push to diversify mm -hmm. the classroom, to bring mm -hmm. more men mm -hmm. into the teaching profession. So, and uh, we got to work on that as well. Okay. Yeah. There are other avenues to, to sort of tackle the same kind of an issue. I think one of the things that you're involved in is where you partnered with Cal State Dominguez Hills and KJLH Radio. Mm -hmm. And you had an event, the Men's Empowerment Summit. Can you tell us a bit about that? It was our first annual at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Uh, we did it a few months ago. Uh, we had over a thousand participants come in from all across LA County. Uh, and we had various segments, a, a breakdown from uh, mentor, mentorship, uh, college readiness, to uh, uh, spiritual involvement in the community as well. Uh, great uh, uh, spokespersons like Jim Hill, sportscaster, was uh, a part of the panel uh, of discussion, and we did criminal justice reform as well, talking about some of the challenges that young folks uh, face uh, as it relates to law enforcement. We had uh, great representatives from LAPD there to deal with some of the issues of racial profiling and things of that nature. So we're excited about our first empowerment summit. We look mm -hmm. forward to doing it next year and, and continue to build on that collaboration and bringing in more partners because mm -hmm. it's, it's critically important right now that we address these issues. I was just going to ask, are we going to see more of these? So I'm glad to hear it's the first and there's a plan mm -hmm. to continue. And I would love to see uh, women and, and you know, uh, Latina and African-American women mm -hmm. included in the conversation. Without a doubt. We had Rather. women there that day, and that's what I, I told folks. Yes, this is a, a Boys and Men's Empowerment Summit, but the women are definitely in, 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 uh, welcomed and invited mm -hmm. because their voice is critical mm -hmm. in helping shape, mm -hmm. you know, society. So right. we can't do it just, you know, men alone. So we definitely want that partnership. Excellent. It has to be a group effort. It, it, it? Without I mean, a doubt. Really, it's the, it's the village it, it, without yeah. a doubt. that needs to come together. Uh, I'd like to talk uh, about a couple of bills that you've been involved with. One was um, 
Well, let me just mention SB 621, and that was overtime compensation for fiber school teachers. But you're also pretty, pretty engaged with another bill that was sponsored by our office, SB 344. And I think you have some recent experience this morning, actually. Yeah. Um, this provides for large county offices of education. It provides additional time or enough time to determine an appeal. So that means whether a district can attend a school outside of their home district. So your thoughts on this legislation? I didn't know it was how important that was until, I say, your representative, Pat Gibbs, came to my office and I started doing the research and then realized what a roadblock it is sometimes for a young person, for whatever reason, that needs to transfer based on a curriculum that's available, even bullying that we've found out that it's, it's a growing issue of needing to change not just schools but school districts and, and what a roadblock that was. So it was critically important that this legislation was passed to help expedite that process to allow you guys to better facilitate the movement of students based on whatever those needs are. So it's yeah. critically important. I think it comes back down to one of those option things again, doesn't it? It provides more options than Without for students and for families. Without a doubt. And that's what we hear a lot of times from parents wanting options for their kids. And, um, you know, I, 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 I think it's, we're going to need to do more legislation like that, unfortunately. But, I mean, it, based on where we are right now, we're going to need tools like that to help facilitate, you know, well, we definitely appreciate the support because being such a large county office, mm -hmm. the numbers of, of students and families that are coming in and wanting to make some changes, mm -hmm. we appreciated you um, pushing that forward for us. So thank you. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how you've been distinguished as a state leader on energy and public utility issues. You've also authored numerous bills on energy uh, conservation and the environment. Uh, schools have participated mm -hmm. in state programs designed to improve energy efficiency and expand mm -hmm. clean energy generation. How did you become interested in conserving energy? And tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I, I don't know. I, that's a good question. I, I worked for LA Conservation Corps for a number of years, mm -hmm. uh, uh, working with young adults from 18 to 24. And that was really my initial exposure to the environmental movement mm -hmm. and be it recycling, energy efficiency, and things of that nature, but I also worked for a utility company. Mm -hmm. I worked for Southern California Edison for a number of years, and I chair utilities and commerce in the assembly. So we saw the importance of this whole green movement, mm -hmm. but my biggest yeah. challenge all the time was they always talked about the job opportunities, and I wanted mm -hmm. to make sure the job opportunities were real, mm -hmm. but not only are they real, but they are as diverse as California. Mm -hmm. uh, and the workforce needs to be as diverse as California. So those are some of the issues I was looking at. Mm -hmm. And one of the concerns, and the, I mean, great things I was most concerned about is also rates. Mm -hmm. A lot of times in this whole discussion about renewable energy and things mm -hmm. of that nature, we fail to realize the cost that it, it, it bears on the consumer. So mm -hmm. I've looked at it in a holistic approach and making sure rates are affordable and it, it's it's a great impact uh, mm -hmm. uh, especially for working families mm -hmm. um, uh, keeping the lights on and mm -hmm. uh, the cost of uh, heating a home and cooling a home so uh, it, I, I think it touches us all in some way. Mm -hmm. Well, it allows everybody the opportunity to think green and mm -hmm. you know if you can afford to do it mm -hmm. and it's thank you. Isn't this an area that's that's constantly shifting though? I mean uh, most issues are but mm -hmm. in this one particularly with with conservation, with energy, it, it also very much ties into what's happening at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Without so. a doubt. And I, I mean, this whole green movement is, is, is one that needs to be supported. Uh, I guess, again, another challenge is often that we, we, we weigh the cost of businesses doing wholesale changes to the way they procure uh, energy or produce energy and what that cost means to a business as well. So we have to look at it, like you say, the, the total picture. I, I'm happy to report that Compton Unified School District took advantage of a lot of this energy efficiency money. They now have solar that's being uh, installed at Benjamin Davis uh, Middle School in the mm -hmm. city of Compton. They're doing a lot of the energy efficiency and changing out the windows. I mean, mm -hmm. once you seal the unit up, you can bring down your your heating and, and cooling costs. So uh, Compton Unified, and I hope more school districts take advantage of it because outside of faculty and uh, staff costs, your, your biggest cost is uh, your utilities. So you're saying in a sense that maybe a short-term investment is going to pay off long-term? Without a doubt. 
yeah. without a doubt. And we need to continue to focus there and making sure those funds are available to, to help these schools become, and businesses become retrofitted and have the energy efficient programs that are available. Let's talk about, or can you talk about some of the key issues that come in front of that committee? Uh, again, uh, renewable power, jobs, diversity. I mean, one of the issues I have always championed is, the, again, the diversity of that workforce and making sure that young folks also, if they want to get into this area of green energy, that there are real jobs and, opportunity. and, and real opportunities. Are we and, getting any better? Are we getting uh, closer? Well, I, I, I'm, here's where I probably sour the table a little bit. Mm -hmm. The promise of jobs aren't there mm -hmm. uh, because with technology you need less and less bodies mm -hmm. and no one wants to talk about that. Mm -hmm. I can run a hundred megawatt uh, solar plant with 10 people versus a hundred megawatt mm -hmm. hydro or a combined heating power plant where I have 30 people around the clock mm -hmm. you know on staff so we, we need fewer and fewer people so I, I don't want to mislead folks to say that this is the real growth industry mm -hmm. for young folks mm -hmm. because I really don't see it as that mm -hmm. but I see there's opportunities there mm -hmm. be it more so on the energy efficiency side versus mm -hmm. the renewable side. Mm -hmm. But given that role of in a sense technology mm -hmm. Doesn't that go to the issue again of making sure that our workforce is prepared to take that on? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, I, I passed a bill uh, a few years ago uh, that was focused on low-income solar in those communities, but working with a nonprofit grid alternative mm -hmm. to train young women and young men to install solar on residential homes. So uh, training that workforce is important because, uh, again, as we continue to promote uh, folks uh, putting uh, solar on their homes, we want to make sure, again, folks mm -hmm. in those communities have opportunity to have jobs in there. So we're training folks mm -hmm. in that. Uh, Long Beach Community College has a, a great uh, solar program, training program, and we're hoping mm -hmm. more uh, community colleges offer that as an option as well. And that's why it's so important for us, uh, preschool through, through you know, uh, 12th grade, that we're aligning our career tech to have that pathway mm -hmm. to the programs that are mm -hmm. existing at the community colleges mm -hmm. and that we're all communicating and working together so that our high schools are offering the types of programs that the community colleges are, are moving forward so we're Good better idea. aligned. Yes. Safety is such a big issue and a big concern in, in everyone's minds these days. You have a bill, SB 549, that talks about safety issues that impact local communities. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Um, that bill was, uh, I introduced that bill this year and the governor signed it. SB 549 deals with making sure that utilities live up to the programs that they committed to under their funding. Uh, utilities every three years have to file a junior rate case. And under their junior rate case, you have to line out what you're doing with this money. Many times we have seen in the past that a utility to say, I'm gonna spend five million, this is used that figure, on infrastructure improvement and safety and then sometime along those three years, they ship that money somewhere else. We're seeing SB 549 says, if you say that money's for safety and it's for inspection and it's for improvements, that money has to stay there unless you go back to the PUC and ask to move that money. Right. So we have found that utilities constantly say, I'm doing it for safety. Case in point, San Bruno in 2010, they were supposed to be doing pipeline inspections, they weren't doing it, mm. and we saw what happened there. So we're seeing if you're asking for this money and it's dedicated for space, uh, safety, mm -hmm. you spend it on safety. So that's the accountability piece. It, very much sure. accountability. Excellent. Yeah. Have you seen instances of that where things like that have happened without having to go back to the PUC? Is that why you see the need to have Oh, without a doubt. Bill? I mean, they, they were able to move this money until this bills, mm -hmm. but now they have to go back and say, okay, if I sit, uh, we ask for whatever that amount is for safety before you can move it, you have to go back to the PUC and get authorization mm -hmm. for it. Fulfill the commitment that exactly, you made. Exactly, because they've moved money many times. Wonderful. So you've done a lot, and we appreciate your support. Can you tell us a little bit about what some of your legislative um, priorities are for this coming year? I, I mean, uh, continuing with criminal justice reform, again, mm -hmm. expanding on whatever we can do to improve education. Mm -hmm. I'm always uh, amazed that still we still have segregated schools mm -hmm. here in California, and how do we make sure that 
those schools that have a greater minority population uh, get the resources they need uh, mm -hmm. compared to schools in other more influent districts. Mm -hmm. I, I just saw a report earlier this year that San Francisco, one of the most liberal cities <laughs> in, in California, if not the mm -hmm. country, has one of the worst uh, graduation rates for minority kids and, mm -hmm. and, and, and the worst funding mm -hmm. for uh, their schools and, and have mm -hmm. probably the most segregated schools. So mm -hmm. dealing with that, again, more energy efficiency, uh, job development, true uh, mm -hmm. uh, diversity. I've been a big proponent on workforce diversity, women and minority contracting. We passed uh, the gas tax SB1, but part of the language in that states that of the billions of dollars that are going to be uh, raised through this mm -hmm. gas tax that we contract with women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, and disabled veteran-owned businesses. So mm -hmm. I want to continue to expand upon that as well. Well, wonderful. I just want to, you know, again, thank you for your um, advocacy, for equity, for education. Uh, it, it's just shameful that, you know, in California that we're practically at the bottom and, the, you know, 47th in terms mm -hmm. of what we invest in our mm -hmm. children. Uh, and yet we spend so much on incarcerating. Uh, even I would just recently, you know, was aware that that we spend about two hundred forty seven thousand dollars a year on each youth that is incarcerated mm -hmm. versus, you know, the amount, you know, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars that we spend on educating mm -hmm. them. So thank you for being so outspoken on that. Well, thank you mm -hmm. for working with me and uh, providing me with the tools and the mm -hmm. resources to, to do my job mm -hmm. in an area of education. Well, it's unfortunate that you don't have some passion for what it is that you're taking <laughs> on. Yeah. Any final thoughts that you have in terms of, you know, how you approach education? I think we've kind of heard that throughout, but just a chance to kind of summarize. I, my parents taught me at an early age, you can lose money, you can lose a home, you can lose mm -hmm. everything. But the one thing they can't take from you is your education. Mm -hmm. So we've always valued education, and I just want you know, families to understand the importance of education and young folks' the importance of education because it is really the one tool that will uh, allow you for career growth, mm -hmm. success in life. Uh, and I, I, I want to stress that. I mean, and I, I'm really want us to really invest in, and let California, again, lead the nation as, as, as a beacon of light for education. Again, here in the state of California, over the last 30 years, we've built more prisons than we have built universities. Mm -hmm. So we need to, uh, you know, reverse that number mm -hmm. and start building more classrooms for, uh, be it higher education or K through 12. So I want to make that a priority. Thank you thank so you. much for your no, service. No, thank you. Well, there's a great deal we could continue to talk about, but we've come to the end of our program. This show is brought to you by the Los Angeles County Office of Education, a public agency dedicated to serving students, supporting communities, and leading educators. If you'd like to know more about the Los Angeles County Office of Education, you can visit us online at www.lacoe.edu. For questions, comments, or suggestions, you can email us at the address that you see on your screen. On behalf of the Los Angeles County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Deborah Duardo, and our special guest, California State Senator Stephen Bradford, I'm Frank Kwan, and until our next Schools on Point, thank you for joining us.